Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on IMRS TV today uh, for this presentation brought to you by Seaflow. So without further ado, I will hand over to our host for today. Uh, Rolly, over to you. Hello and welcome uh, to this uh, today's webinar, IMRS webinar. Uh, um, I'm Rolly Rogers, I'm your host for the, for the next hour. Um, we have uh, been told that they're likely to have at least 500 delegates participating, to, participating today, so which is uh, really exciting. It shows you the interest in this particular topic. Um, I, because we've got six panelists, six speakers, I'm not going to read out their, their individual CVs, but if you want to find out more about our panelists, you can find their detailed CVs on the associated page on IMRS for this webinar. The panel for today is made up of Charlie Reith and uh, Kai Langstrom from Seaflow Consultancy, uh, supported by Des Green from GRI Simulations, Alan Anderson, Mitch Mitchell and Shell Erickson from DNV. The title of today's um, uh, talk is um, Virtual Learning of Remote Technologies to Digital Twins. Uh, we, it's a very full uh, talk. So uh, I'm going to pass quickly over now to Charlie Reith, who's CFO's uh, operations uh, director and principal consultant. So over to you, Charlie, to start the talk. Thank you. So what we're aiming to do today is, is to give an introduction to our training services through, through continuous professional development learning. The presentation is further supported by some colleagues uh, from Oceaneer and, and DNV to, to supplement the key topics of today's discussion. So some of the key things that we see across the oil and gas industry and marine industry today in terms of continuous professional development training are the basically the enhancement of the the people and the skills in the sense that we have uh, an aging an aging industry in many senses and we have uh, a number of skills gaps i think it's fair to say the industry has had on off buttons in terms of continuous development training there's been a lot of focus on continuous safety training but on some of the technical and operational sides there's been a number of gaps compared with other industries and I think with the transition to the renewables and the green energy and the blue economy, there's a number of uh, transferable skills and uh, renewable skills need to be uh, attained across marine and subsea. Uh, supplemented by certain elements of the engineering science and the uh, evolution of technology. Transfer knowledge and expertise is a key component to this. And as we move into data digital management and the interpretation of a lot of data across uh, digital twins, which is a big topic, it's evolving rapidly. There's certainly going to be need for uh, more data analysts and uh, personnel to manage data across international hemispheres and, and different uh, operational assets. And using digital technologies in an effective manner. So I think it's fair to say there's, there's a number of challenges, but there's plenty of opportunities as well for people to develop their skills. One of the key themes across this Seafloor Initiative program supported by GI Simulations is when we do training courses, is supplementing the training courses with uh, simulators and live streaming certain parts of some of the training components uh, from some of the examples that we're going to be sharing today from companies like Oceaneer and, and the evolution of their remote technologies and EROVs, where it uh, basically results in less people being offshore, reduce CO2 emissions because you don't have vessels there, uh, bringing real-time inspection data and surveillance data back to teams and asset support engineers onshore, 
and hence the evolution of digital technology and digital data hubs. Uh, moving into the, the, the personnel side of it, this is an extract from the UK Engineering Council, just the standard route for personnel, how they can register to be professional technicians or engineers. A lot of people will be familiar with this, others may not. And a key part of what we see the need to do as well is to, to remind people there's plenty of opportunities to evolve your careers from uh, an apprenticeship through professional development and experience and, do, and through the conventional routes through coming out of university with the appropriate qualifications and further learnings and professional development experience as you progress your careers through to being registered incorporated engineers or chartered engineers or technologists, as the case may be. There are some variances to this in an international sense, and we'll touch on that uh, as we progress the discussion. So competency assessments, in a, in a global sense, there are some regional variances across the world. If you're working in the UK, Far East, Australia, or in the US. We see some variances in marine skill sets and subsea engineering skill sets. And as people progress, let's say, from being a technician, you could be a marine technician, subsea technician, and you're looking to progress your career to be a registered marine technologist. I think a good example of that is likes of, say, an ROV pilot working with enhanced technology and autonomous underwater inspection vehicles, AUVs, uh, AIVs, and subsea drones. Technology is evolving quickly. So, you know, tracking your competency, evolving your competency and your skills through a transition such as that example I've just provided. And what we do in our training courses is is provide uh, a competency assessment and analysis and a planning of how to enhance your skills through further learning and development. And it can be logged in various ways. So for instance, with the Institute of Marine Engineers, or if you're in a, of an SUT member through partnership, there's various ways to log that. So the Institute of Marine Engineers have a system called ECHO. We have, a, we have an online system that can track that further development and learning in parallel. Should you do one course and pick up and do another course at a later date? This is an example of some of the regional variances in competency assessments globally. So uh, just by example, the SUT in Australia rolled out to the public uh, a set of competency skill sets and a very comprehensive program through and in association with Engineers Australia and basically providing a route towards chartered subsea engineer and, and or subsea technologists. So as we work in partnership with the SUT, uh, as you progress, if you want to be a registered technologist in the marine side, like I said earlier, and you're evolving your career working in renewables and the, the green energy solutions, it's quite easy to transfer those skill sets in a managed manner as long as you demonstrate through, you know, logbooks, provide the right evidence, and there's competency assessments can be measured in different ways. And part of that way that we do it is measure the competency through simulators to make sure that everybody's talking the same language and working to the same standards. And, and that, should be this, that should be on a global sense uh, across some of these domains. So that, that example there is just an example of you can be a marine technologist working in subsea and or different aspects of marine engineering. Now, as we move into how to use digital twin technology and the other supplementary presentations that are going to follow this, 
uh, basically digital technology is going to be data driven through decision making processes uh, throughout the execution phase of an operational asset. And that and that data can be managed through a risk-based manner, for instance, where we're doing inspection regimes. So planning inspections, subsea on subsea flow lines, pipelines, subsea infrastructure, and floating production systems is one of the examples that we're going to share today. And the underwater elements of a floating production system and the, and the hull and the mooring lines. But we have other elements of the subsea infrastructure that we are uh, looking to evolve into digital twin technology as well, all the way from subsea wells, what's going on in the reservoir, and taking all that data to a platform that can be taken back to shore <clears throat> and distributed through various operational personnel so they can see in a real-time sense what's going on with the asset if there's any problems beginning to arise in the asset and sharing that information across multiple discipline teams and personnel. This is an example here of uh, how we use simulators. Uh, so it's like doing, uh, you know, over the years, things have evolved from uh, document-driven subsea assets with a lot of two-dimensional models, let's say of an offshore pipeline or, or a subsea structure. Things have evolved to what I would say is a level two, where we've got a lot of 3D visual module, models showing the visible components and their data and how that data is, let's say, aging over time and where the wear and tear is. And the whole point of a digital twin model is to have sitting behind that uh, a model where you can uh, effectively analyze things from its original design to its operational design. Is it still, is it still operating within its original basis of design? Is it operating outside its envelope? and what you, what you can do to make sure it's always staying within its original design parameters. If there's further maintenance inspection required, so it's the level three that we're moving to and, and, we're, and we're actually using in some cases today is real-time data analysis, analysis through condition-based monitoring, which can then result in Hopefully you get an early warning indicator of how things are performing. And again, you can, you can do a lot of good training through that simulation in a controlled environment, in a classroom, and translate that understanding of that uh, evolution to operational people in the field that's maintaining the asset. Uh, there's an example up there of a subsea wellhead system you could be taking data back to an iPhone. You could be looking at what's going on by a subsea choke or a multi-phase four meter changing in a dynamic sense over time. And where you're doing a practical training and safety training, what you, what you might call do it training, uh, you're, you're learning how to enhance your own personal skills to take it to the field. If you're working on a live simulator, we'll, we will bring certain elements of how that simulation is then translated back into the field so that people can practice and enhance some of their skills in a, in a classroom environment on a simulator understand maybe how to do some operations in a slightly different way and how to use the digital technology as we move forward with more of that to help predict issues through planned maintenance regimes. And it's, it's all about enhancing personnel's competency in different aspects of, of the technical to the operational 
parameters of that as well. And we'll show you some good examples of that in the next few minutes. One of the big things in terms of that data management and understanding what you're looking at and through, through collaborated systems such as digital twins is understanding the quality of the data, the accuracy of the data, hence the need to enhance the skills of people, the adaptability of people to work with technology in this manner. So let's call it a little bit, being a little bit more tech savvy, hence the need to further train and adapt some of your skill sets. You could have an AUV or an AIV running along a flow line doing subsea inspection, streaming data through, through 3D format back to the asset, back to shore. Engineers on shore are interpreting that data as you go and you're comparing that information compared, let's say, with the last inspection that was run in the assets, say, three or four or five years ago. So it can bring a lot of information to you in a very quick format, hence the need to be very good at how to interpret the data so you get the accuracy from it and plan ahead. Some of the technical parameters that we're working through behind the scenes here to further define digital twins for different clients. This uh, simple block diagram is just a simple visualization of that. So we're, we, we're looking at having like a predictive engine format. Some companies have already got some of this in place. Uh, DNB will talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the presentation. And as I said in the last slide, analyzing the data, supporting that through updated virtual models from inspection regimes, and the data just continually goes through that loop as time evolves. One of the examples that we're going to share this afternoon is uh, an underwater in lieu of dry dock inspection on a floating production system and the mooring lines and the integrity of the mooring lines. Similar applications of similar technology can certainly be used in a renewable sense for floating wind and some of these offshore hydrogen projects on the subsea components and the marine elements of the technical understanding of what's going on, the, on, on under the water, if you like. That's the areas that we're particularly interested in within Seaflow and our consultancy work for different clients. And as I say, as these technologies roll into clean energy transition, we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us in the industry and, 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 and the world, let's say, over the next 10 years or more. There's a number of targets have been set for 2035 and 2050 for, you know, clean, clean environment. We've got to manage the world that we're living in and do our bit to cut CO2 emissions. We're still going to be producing a lot of natural gas, LNG, through the next 30, 35 years. That's not going to go away any quicker than that, that's for sure, because it's still a major contribution to energy and power. But we need to do it in a clean manner. Uh, you know, Seafloor, we're a member of Subsea UK with access to a wide global underwater engineering hub and a collaborative network through other organizations like SUT as well. And we can bring a lot into the training as we evolve CPD training through that network. And we will, and we'll bring in guest speakers to our training to complement the specialist areas and the evolution of the technology as required. That's where I see some of the enhancements that are needed in training across the industry today. And the ability for the industry and the supply chain to adapt and transition with these clean energies is a big thing. As I say, I think the marine and the subsea industries are a little bit behind some of the other industries in the evolution of training. And I only have to look at the 
aviation industry, how, let's say, how the aviation industry trained pilots and stuff like that using simulators. Well, I think we're a little bit behind the, the same space in terms of how people are trained. Uh, beyond that, the Institute of Marine Engineers rolled out the Ocean Aware program the end of last year. Again, respectful of maintaining clean oceans and the environment. And there's a huge amount of associated and aligned opportunities across, across the blue economy for subsea and marine engineering. And we're all aligned to making that happen in this next 10 to 20 years plus. Science, regulative policies, industry challenges. There's a huge amount of things that we're living with to, that can impact the change to that climate and continuous professional development training can go a long way to making that uh, transition go smoothly as well. I'm now gonna hand over to a colleague of mine, Kai, to talk about the next few slides. Thank, thank you, Charles. Um, at a higher level, the three core elements to the digital transformation are data, connectivity, and integration, put across all disciplines and all phases of the project. And that's quite important to understand. Also, it's essential to ensure that uh, the digital twin evolves as, a, as the asset um, physically evolves and deteriorates with time and as your business needs change. Uh, typically, when we start with data for digital twins, we are always starting with environment, FPSOs and such like. We start with envir environmental data, vessel motion data, loadings, structural data. It's all transmitted ashore. And uh, this allows us then to start doing global checks, load checks, strength checks, uh, using the updated digital twin and models. And also it allows us to do simulations and decisions based on real time data on, on, and on the actual condition of the asset. We can do specialist checks as well. For instance, if you have a, a cargo tank uh, taken out of service for repair and maintenance, we can do structural checks, uh, strength checks based on the uh, actual facility as it is. Uh, so key here is real-time decisions based on real-time data and analysis. Okay, Charlie, next. Um, the industry is also in process of uh, looking at, um, in addition to the underwater inspection in lieu of uh, dry docking, which is usually carried out with uh, ROVs or uh, AUVs. We are also looking at uh, inspection of internal structure and, and incorporating that in, in the digital, digital uh, twins. And we are looking at the mooring systems and the turret systems or FPSOs, floating production facilities, and, and um, getting that in the digital, digital twin model as well for use. Okay, Charlie, next, please. Uh, the asset groups the course is focusing on will be FPSOs, FLNG, floating LNG, and LNG floating storage and regasification units. And the digital twin technology and digitalization for these facilities will be directly also applicable to floating wind and offshore hydrogen generation projects. The areas included, as we briefly discussed before, uh, will be hull structures, cargo and ballast systems and mooring systems. The, the ballast systems, uh, the digital twins will be in concept very similar to those used for topside systems. And from these digital PNIDs, you can see the status of the systems of valves, pumps, drivers, etc. cetera. And, and that is shown actually on some of the screens here. And, and we will, be doing work with this on, on these in the course during the course. Okay, next one, Charles, please. Now let's look a bit more on, on, on mooring system integrity. Again, we will start with, with uh, 
vessel environmental data, uh, motion data uh, on, on site. Then we'll have a vessel position sensing data in real time using GPS. And this will also give us vessel offsets due to uh, waves, wind and current. And it will give us offsets uh, if there is a mooring line failure. Uh, and it will include the transit offset, so we get actually the extreme conditions. Uh, we can get data on mooring uh, line loads by measuring the departure angles using sonar and calculate backwards from there the loads. And this will also detect the line failures because the line will either hang straight or will be missing on the sonar scanner. Uh, then we can do correlation between actual data and predicted analysis based data as, as we obtained during the engineering phase. Okay, next one, please. Now to the more interesting bits. Once we have all that data, then when you are looking at um, uh, the integrity of the mooring chain, for instance, itself, uh, we can do nowadays uh, in water condition surveys of the chain links, uh, determining the amount of corrosion they suffered and the amount of wear they uh, suffered uh, by measuring, for instance, the extension of, of five links underwater. Um, from this, because we know at what, what point in time this is done, you can actually uh, work out deterioration rates predicted on data. Uh, we can actually forecast the remaining service life of the chain. Uh, we can start doing real-time data-driven decisions on IMR or replacement requirements and schedules. Uh, we can actually start saying I'm pinpointing down the time when we had to start ordering um, spares and materials for replacing sections of change or complete change. Uh, and finally, we can do reliable prediction effects or effects of any mooring line failure. Uh, if a mooring line fails, now we can start to estimate the, the current safety factors of the remaining lines and make decisions based on uh, data affecting operations and productions and regarding revised limiting environmental uh, conditions from which we are allowed to operate. Next slide, please. When it comes to wire mooring systems, it's exactly the same concept, except that we are, except that we are using uh, robots that can climb up and down the mooring line. Uh, to survey the line, uh, typically checking for fatigue damage, broken strands or, or sheath damage. And again, the, the data is transmitted to the shore um, directly and, and the models can be updated, mooring system models can be updated accordingly. And uh, we can do the same types of evaluations and analysis on, on uh, uh, actual system uh, in real time. And um, the key here is to get the information always quickly to short or and process and analyze quickly. Uh, during the course, we're looking at doing some case studies on this. Okay, next one, please. As a summary on all this, high level summary, uh, the main objective is to enable candidates and students to understand how proactive asset maintenance facilitated by these emerging digital technologies and, and consequential data-driven decision-making in conjunction with the regulatory authorities can reduce operating costs with time uh, when compared with traditional reactive maintenance approach. And this is particularly true during latter parts of the asset operating life, as shown in the graph below. You can see that the first uh, six to seven years, there's virtually no cost benefit for, for a proactive approach. Uh, but then after that, the, the curve starts uh, diverging. And after about 10, 11 years, you are starting to see real cost benefits from, from this um, uh, proactive uh, approach based on using the 
digitalization and digital twins. Okay, that's where I finish, Charles. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to come out of this now and I'm going to let Des uh, share some examples of digital models before we go into the Oceanian presentation. So I'll stop. And Des, if you bring up. Yeah, Des, <clears throat> so the first model, uh, can everybody, I guess, can see the screen here. Um, the first model uh, is the FPSO with mooring lines and uh, risers connected to the turret. <clears throat> this is running in GRI's uh, IDEA FDK software or a field development kit. Uh, IDEA is an acronym for um, Integrated uh, Design and Engineering Analysis Field Development Kit. So it's a life of field uh, data visualization tool that we've developed. Uh, based on our subsea simulation technology. And uh, all of these models are uh, geo-referenced, uh, you know, spatially correct, uh, accurate to real world assets. And of course, data can be linked uh, into any, uh, any of the models attached to uh, equipment in 3D space to give context to your data. Uh, different types of uh, you know, existing data can be or imported, uh, field layout drawings, uh, GIS mapping data, et cetera. <clears throat> this model is work in progress, so all of the uh, equipment is not uh, assembled in, in the drill centers. But, uh, just give you a quick show of some of the editing capabilities. Um, software can also be used for uh, for changing the model. We can make quick changes to the model based on updated data. Um, you know, you can change jumper shapes, equipment positions, uh, flexible, uh, flexible line positions. It can all be edited, updated, uh, you know, based on real as-built data that can be imported as well. And, and data linked to all of these points. Um, you know, any, any specific important positions on a piece of equipment can be attached with a smart point where we can also attach associated data. And uh, we can then color shade uh, any of the geometry, you know, for, for uh, if you have structural, structural fatigue analysis data for say the hull, for instance, that can be, you know, color mapped um, to the geometry here. So you can get an idea of uh, you know, the locations of interest. Uh, same thing with any flexibles, um, you know, where you have maybe bending stress uh, data or anything like that, structural fatigue. Uh, you know, these cables can be color mapped to, to reflect the data and, and show areas of concern. It's probably good for this one. Hey, Charles, I'll switch over to the uh, yeah, that's light, light well intervention. Just briefly run through that because we're conscious we need to let yeah. allow us near and sufficient time. Next. Okay, so the second model what we're going to show here is um, a recorded simulation that I'm playing back. And this is from a uh, light well intervention uh, simulation that Seaflow is going to be using to support uh, upcoming training um, initiative. <clears throat> So this is running our VROV software, which is designed for uh, subsea simulation um, with a focus around uh, remotely operated vehicle activities. Um, <clears throat> so we have um, 
intervention system being deployed overboard the vessel here. This is uh, Oceaneering's Boris system. <clears throat> and the bottom two screens are ROV camera views. Well, sorry, the bottom left is an ROV camera view. Bottom right is the uh, sonar. Of course, this all happens in real time. So I'm just going to skip through a bit uh, to kind of get down to depth and, and get, the, get the ROV into play here. And this is just showing installation of this piece of equipment uh, onto the, the well on the seafloor. And then there'll be other pieces of equipment uh, added to the kit. And um, in further exercises, there'll be some uh, light weld intervention uh, being performed with wireline tools down through the down through the well path. I'll just skip ahead again so we get to some of the uh, ROV intervention. Um, you know, actually interact with the equipment, uh, dynamic collision detection. Um, you know, it's all, this is all uh, being calculated by a physics engine in the background. It's not an animation. You know, we've, we're flying these ROVs with, uh, with control systems that an ROV pilot would use and uh, all the dynamics uh, can be adjusted, sea states, current, um, you know, weather, visibility to reflect um, you know, realistic offshore conditions. I'll just skip down and kind of complete this uh, installation uh, so we can, we can get on with the rest of the presentation. Good, Charles? Yeah, it's good. Thanks, Des. You're welcome. We'll hand over to Alan. Okay, thank you. Um, just to cover a little bit about an introduction to Oceaneering's next generation of ROV systems, uh, what we've been developing to support the uh, the uh, the timely acquisition of data to, for uh, for digital twin modeling going forward. Um, Oceaneering are a leading global provider of engineered products and services, and we operate the world's premier fleet of ROVs, uh, and are the world's leading provider of ROVs to the energy industry. We've got a fleet of around 250 work-class ROVs, and there's over 120 rigs and 100 vessels globally which have oceaneering subsea robotic systems on board today. However, the world of robotics is changing, and oceaneering uh, are, are changing too. Uh, historically, subsea robotics ROV systems have relied upon the operator or the ROV pilot to operate the vehicle and undertake the task uh, in a hands-on manner. The, the, the pilot is very much in the loop. He is the loop or he or she is the loop uh, and, and operate the ROV to conduct the task. However, the subsea robotics of tomorrow will, will firstly start to undertake the bulk of the work, the work themselves with human operators there to verify accuracy and the completion of the tasks. And ultimately the aim of robotics designers is to, uh, to take the human out of the loop or, or to put them to the side uh, with human involvement not required uh, for the machine to finish it. Uh, it becomes, uh, the machine becomes more accurate and, and self-sufficient in terms of decision-making and able to conduct the operation uh, independently. So that's where the, the goal of subsea robotics is going. So as a result, Oceaneering have been working on their next generation of ROVs for a number of years. These vehicles are uh, the Freedom, a hybrid AUV ROV with long range speed and data gathering capability of, of an AUV but unlike an AUV, also has the ability to hover and conduct rotational movements to provide close visual inspection of subsea assets. Liberty, a subsea resident work class ROV system, which is completely operated from an onshore remote operation center and vastly reduces the need for ROV support vessel and therefore is less weather dependent. Esrus is a work class ROV system which provides a more persistent ROV for use in high current conditions typically seen during re in renewables work sites. So you can see that not only is Oceaneering developing a robotics platforms of tomorrow, but it's also recognizing the works, the challenges of work sites today. Going to uh, onshore remote operation centers. So, uh, 
Oceaneer are proudly claimed to be the pioneers in this uh, in this technology. Uh, we we originally direct demonstrated this uh, as a proof of concept to customers in 2004. The remote operations center is our key technology building block for Oceaneering's uh, operations. Uh, typically, we would use 4G mobile communications such as TAPnet or, or we would use satellite communications uh, if, if that's not available in the worksite, which connects the, the offshore location to the uh, onshore remote operations centre. This enables Oceaneering to have ROVs pilot from a traditional onshore, offshore ROV control room and from the onshore remote operations center where an extra pilot or a subject matter can also be located. So Oceaneer and our market leaders in this style of operation, having built up a, an enviable track record from our two facilities, one in Morgan City, Louisiana, and another in Stavanger, Norway. We have operated more than 22 ROV systems and provided over 3,800 operator days uh, giving customers a 24-7 project support. These facilities can be used to pilot both our conventional fleet of ROV systems and our next generation of ROV systems. Moving on to discuss the Liberty EROV system uh, and how this will facilitate customers with a digital twin strategy. Our Liberty EROV is deployed within its garage into this, onto the seabed. It has a, a communications buoy, which uh, uses 4G satellite fiber communications uh, to connect it to the onshore remote operations center. Uh, so the communications buoy can be re removed for connection to a fixed fiber, fiber connection. Um, or it can be fitted with a communications buoy, which has a 4G, net, 4G uh, antenna in it. Um, system has depth rating of about a thousand meters just now, and it's an excursion of around thousand meters from from the the, the, the resident position. The Liberty system proof of concept was completed in 2019 and has been operational since. The key technology building blocks for the Liberty system have been the remote operations center, the communications buoy and deployment system, the electric work class ROV system comprising uh, electric propulsion, uh, 135 kilowatt tooling circuit and automated or manually operated manipulator system. It's also uh, the battery and battery management system, which is key to, to its success and the resident vehicle garage and tether management system. Those are the components that go into making the, the Liberty system uh, what it is. And the benefits that the Liberty will give customers is it's less weather dependent. So it's typically an ROV system will operate at around sea state six, whereas that's the, the limitation due to vessel deployment. Uh, whereas with uh, just the communication boy being on the surface and exposed to the weather conditions, we're increasing the weather conditions up to sea state seven, sea state eight, depending on uh, uh, maintaining the communications link to the, the remote operations center. And although a vessel is required to deploy and recover the Liberty system, once it's deployed, there isn't any need for the vessel to remain on station, uh, therefore reducing the CO2 emissions and avoiding disruption perhaps on board a platform if we were a platform launching an ROV. Uh, but it's also remaining available at customer's convenience, which is, is critical where you're trying to build up uh, a data set, particularly on a, a challenged installation where weather conditions can cause issues that, uh, that subject matter experts will want to, to look at um, what's happening for up manning and down manning of platforms. So Liberty is a, is a great solution for inspection as a, or as support for a jack-up rig operation or as a force multiplier, um, just generally to provide ROV capability where perhaps a vessel or launching from a platform is not the ideal solution. But really the important point is that this is a, this is a solution which will provide ROV capability 
which will match phases of work without having to keep a vessel waiting. I'm going to run through a video, uh, which just shows a little bit about the Liberty system, uh, how it works. So Liberty is typically installed uh, today using a standard IMR vessel with a crane. Complete package is, uh, weighs around 28 tonnes, approximately nine metres long and three metres wide. Once deployed, the, the buoy will uh, automatically deploy uh, and reel out so that the buoy is uh, immediately uh, starting to communicate back to the remote operations centre. This means that the ROV can then assist in its own deployment. First of all, here shown deploying the, the mud map. and then disconnecting its deployment line. Liberty system is, as I said, it's an electric work class ROV with a thousand meter excursion from the, uh, the resident cage. It's got an automated deploy, buoy deployment system, so there's no need for that to be, uh, to be managed. And uh, depending on the duration of the, uh, of the deployment, uh, it's going to save quite quite some uh, CO2 emission compared to having a vessel stay on station. Uh, your endurance will range from somewhere between three days and 100 days, depending on how much utilization of the ROV you're, you're going to have. Uh, lots of flying, lots of tasks, lots of tooling, uses up lots of battery, as can be seen, it depletes it. And uh, there is only so much stored energy within the Liberty system, but that's about five, uh, 500 kilowatt hours. Once the battery is depleted, the, uh, a downline can be deployed from uh, a surface installation to charge it. I think it's going to be shown in a minute. Oh, so Liberty is an impressive track record from uh, initial launch in June 2019 to the end of 2020. Uh, the system's completed 31 deployments and has spent over 207 days in the water. It's uh, been used to conduct a range of tasks from periodic ROV inspections through well commissioning and uh, valve operations. But the, uh, the, the important point is Liberty, Liberty has a persistence which allows uh, ROV services to be available at a customer's requirement. And it's not always... Uh, convenient to get an ROV onto location uh, immediately, but Liberty can stay on standby and wait for that time, which uh, saves the customer the uh, vessel, vessel standby rate. Moving on to Freedom. Freedom's our uh, autonomous uh, system. It can operate as a tethered ROV or as a, a disconnected AUV. It's as fast as an AUV, but as agile as an ROV. Uh, a combination of capabilities can, sh she can firstly be used as a long range uh, autonomous underwater vehicle or AUV, fully equipped for ne with the necessary scanning instruments to, uh, to gather the data required. Secondly, due to her unique ability to hover, she is an excellent platform to conduct close visual inspection of anomalies. And finally, due to her tooling port, tooling changer, she can also conduct uh, uh, intervention works. Freedom's been an immensely complex development project from the outset, but in order to properly develop and qualify this type of technology, Oceaneering have made a considerable investment in our living lab in Tau, Norway. This facility has provided the development and test team with realistic sea conditions and work scenarios to, to test the hardware and autonomous software which is necessary for this robotics platform. Freedom has been a project where the hardware has been as complex to develop as the software. The next generation of ROV systems must meet the customer's requirement for improved reliability and the practical reality that remote operations mean the system's just not accessible to do maintenance in the same way that that would have been carried out on a, a system that was launched and recovered on a daily basis. Therefore, Freedom's not only required a talented team of software engineers to develop the autonomy features, 
but it's also had an equally talented group of engineers to develop low maintenance, reliable thrusters, a unique pressure tolerant, tolerant control and communication system called IPEMS, a uh, pressure tolerant high capacity battery system, the low drag hull, the emergency recovery system, and the integration of new generation of precise sensors. The operational flexibility of freedom is driven by the Compass supervisory control software where the vehicle is operating with or without a tether. The vehicle provides full, software provides full vehicle control, autonomy, payload and sensor control, topside mission planning and situational awareness. The purpose-built software Compass some Compass software provides the, key, the vehicle with pilot and improvements, including an unprecedented level of situational awareness in a crowded subsea field. The Freedom RV can be programmed to make pilot decisions without the need for human pilot control, such as avoiding obstacles which are either known or detected by its sensors or responding to, the change, to changing plans which can be uploaded to it acoustically. Five minutes to go, Alan. Okay, doke. So developed features of Compass include uh, pipeline detection, pipeline following, uh, crossing detection, crossing inspection, free span detection, anode detection, and both known and unknown object avoidance. Low altitude pipeline inspection is really one of its main fortes. This system is fitted with late generation of scanning systems for gathering the required data. So INS, digital stills, dynamic laser scanning system, reson multi-beam. It's got USBL beacon and color zoom cameras for conventional close visual inspection. Let's skip on from that. As I said, the Living Lab has been very important to the development and testing and qualification of freedom. During our development program, we've conducted over 1,200 tests in a near real environment. It gives us confidence that when freedom does enter service due to be later in 2021, they will be ready to serve the customers. The Liberty and Freedom Next Generation program has given Oceaneer in much more than just the two products I've described today. They've given Oceaneer in the technical building blocks to develop the fleet of next generation subsea robotic systems. We have a proven capability of deploying long term self sufficient resident ROV and AUV systems ready to work when customers need them. We've developed highly reliable components such as thrusters and control computers, battery systems developed the autonomy capability which provides a stable yet fast platform to gather required data customers need to inform their intelligent diagnostic systems. Freedom's currently undergoing TRL6 qualification trials and Liberty has over 5,000 hours of operations, 210 days of work under her belt already. ISRA systems number two, three and four have all successfully entered service in 2021 and remote operations remote services of over 45,000 hours of track record. So hopefully I've demonstrated Ocean Union's ge next generation ROV program is already well underway. That, thank you, I'll hand over to Mitch. All right, uh, thanks guys. Uh, my name is Mitch Johnson, program manager for our UL group. And our focus is carrying out niche services for class and regulatory surveys. So we are centralized in Houston, but we have SMEs that travel uh, globally. And we're trying to change that for us and for our customers through our remote UALs, uh, which we'll discuss today. So as Alan mentioned, we do have a diverse fleet of ROVs, um, but we have ROVs that can fit in the palm of your hand all the way to work-class ROVs to, to our freedom. And I'm just gonna go ahead and play this video, kind of a long lead up time uh, while I continue speaking. Um, but we have, we also have tools that can, that can clean anything. We have the HD cameras, the 3D cameras, uh, cameras that can see in low visibility, cameras that can travel up openings to, to inspect valves, all collecting data, um, different ways for collecting data in different forms and shapes. And what we do with that data has a lot of potential to tie in with digital twin. Um, but our footprint, our footprint is global to meet, to meet the demand, um, the remote t communications and technology that world is getting a lot smaller for us. Uh, this is our UWILD video. Uh, we have a lot of different ways to mobilize, whether it's on one of our vessels or one of the onboard ROVs, <clears throat> but something for every job. Uh, but once we are offshore, 
Uh, we have HD cameras for visual inspections and collecting data, as you see here, primarily looking at gathering data on the hull and structure. Um, not shown here is we also have uh, internal, uh, internal uh, 3D photogrammetry cameras. Um, but this is for cleaning. We have uh, different, cleaning, different cleaning tools uh, for, for cleaning the surface and getting a good, good data. Um, and then our newest addition is our magnetic crawler. Uh, we can offer subsea NDT without putting divers in harm's way. And the crawler will offer data collection in forms of ACF NDT or UT readings. Uh, to inspect for any cracking. And it can launch from main deck or right from the ROV, as you can see here. But a big part of our data collection is just scanning and visual inspection for these hulls and tanks. It's, it's basically large services of information to be collected. Um, and, and not shown here, we can go internally inspect with a smaller ROV from internally. Um, but mooring equipment and, and also piping is other important items to be scanned and, and bring back to be analyzed for, for damage or corrosion or into a model, a 3D model. Uh, all angles of the structure must be scanned to enhance the quality of the model or analyze the condition of the structure. Um, and of course, if there's any damage found, you know, we'd be with the, with the DNV or ABS or class surveyor and stop and, and clearly focus on those details. So this is just kind of our, our pace that we would be inspecting um, and also we're looking at anodes, you know, on this structure. Really getting a good, good feel for, for what's going on on the structure down there. But all of our tooling is plug and play. Um, you know, we, we have a wide, a wide variety of uh, toolbox tools and mostly CP and UT probes are some of the most common tools that we have available that we bring out on, on most jobs to, to gather different types of data to input into the model. Uh, <clears throat> mooring lines are also, we talked about earlier on this uh, presentation, was uh, important to inspect on a periodic basis. And, you know, we, have, we do have specialized chain cleaning and chain scanning tools uh, to analyze the condition. And, you know, chain links must be cleaned 100% to get that good data. Uh, we have 3D photogrammetry cameras that can get data down to the sub-millimeter accuracy to uh, determine the condition of the chain link and the wear. Uh, we also have, you know, the, the traditional caliper measurement tools, but all, all the lines must be scanned top to bottom. And then we have a focus on um, the touchdown areas. But whatever the job we're doing and the tool we're using, it's the same process for transmitting data. The ROV, ROV feed will send data to the ROV shack as shown here, uh, which is received and securely encoded through an encoder. Then the data is transmitted <clears throat> via satellite to the decoder on shore and stored on the cloud, kind of the process shown here. And then the streaming video and the data can be, can be ready of, uh, uh, immediately. And uh, the video is viewed through an online portal via Amazon Web Services. Um, our oceaneering model is called the Oceaneering Media Vault. Um, there's other forms that you can view this, this video. This is just ours. Um, and that information then can be shared, edited, or recorded. Uh, so that's, that's our video. And really, the trans, to transmit the data, the bandwidth is critical. Um, we, have our own, we have our own sales system, which is shown on the bottom right, which guarantees you know, real-time video speeds and 99% uptime. But there's other methods. You know, we, can use, uh, we can use the existing internet bandwidth on board. Um, we, you, know, you run into some latency expectations with that. Um, and it's always challenging work with the local internet providers, but it's always an option. And we, you know, we, we've been doing this for the last four years. Um, on the bottom left is our first one we did, you know, doing this from, from a, a laptop with, with DNV in the, in, the, in the office with us. And so, you know, we, in conclusion, we do have kind of a tool and a method for every job. Not every job's the same. And the remote technology is making the methods a lot quicker and safer for, for our customers and saves a lot of time. So it's a positive program and we look forward to its uh, future growth with, with everyone here. So thank you. Yeah, are you happy for me to take over? Yes. Yeah. I just gonna say Roland, we had a 
bit of a DNB presentation, but we're kind of running short on time to go through that. Just mention that there is a separate session running on the 17th of June where DNB will be helping us deliver a more detailed presentation on their recommended practice A204 for how to qualify a digital twin. But we'll certainly take some questions on that. We've got an expert from DNB available, but as I say, there will be an opportunity to go into that in more detail in a separate session. So the first question I have uh, is from uh, someone called Ender. It asks, what level of detail do the twins have? Are they effectively databases or are they physics-based models or perhaps a combination of the two? What level of detail do the twins have? Are they effectively databases or are they physical-based models or perhaps a combination of two? I think a simple answer to that is it's going to be a combination of the two. Okay. Next question from Anonymous. How significant will the role of a relevant digital twin be to achieving full autonomy in subsea marine robotics? And at what part of the journey will it impact on? That's an excellent question. Uh... Is there a view amongst the panelists about, I mean, will digital twins speed up the achievement of AI within the within the community, or it, will it play no part? Or if it if it does play a part, where in that journey will it play a part? Gathering of the, okay. So I was just going to say that the gathering of the data is is going to be the key part, and and the ability to use uh, analytics on it is it is going to evolve over the years. So I, I would think it would certainly help. Okay, thank you. Next question uh, from A. Arizi. Having more remote instruments to support digital twin will mean more subsea infrastructure is going to be required. How, how is this going to be attractive? How is this going to be an attractive venture for the client? I think nice. into, it, it, is it going to cost more? And will the, will the client be interested in that extra cost? No, I, I would say, uh, I'll take that one. I'll say it. there's a lot of instrumentation and and data methods available in subsea technology at the moment. It's how you use it and making sure it's reliable as you go. There's been some reliability over the issues over the years with subsea sensors and condition performance based technologies. But I don't see uh, an, a hugely incremental level of extra technology needing to be put subsea, it's how we correlate that data in a real-time model behind the scene. Thank you, Charlie. Next question is from Leroy Mathias. For, for a mooring chain of a particular diameter, is a digital twin model created only for a particular chain leak or a section or for the entire chain as a whole? Do you want me to take that, Charlie? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, usually it's for the whole chain, for the whole mooring system. Thank you, Hodge. Um, how, how, is oceaneering, how oceaneering is planning to use ROVs for predictive analysis? I mean, what kind of sensors will be used? How is oceaneering planning ROVs for predictive analysis? I mean, what, and the question is, what, and what kind of sensors will be used? The, the sensors fitted to the vehicles uh, will typically be dependent on the task that's being carried out. Uh, as Mitch said uh, in, in his uh, in his discussion, there's uh, the NDT sensors that are used, but then on a pipelines project, they will be using laser scanning and multi-beam uh, echo sounders. Um, but as and INS systems, so uh, uh, as uh, new sensors evolve, uh, such as vision systems. Uh, uh, and machine vision systems, they'll be progressively added to the vehicles. So that's an evolving situation, but uh, typically it's um, it's driven by the task at the moment and uh, what's available. Thank you, Alan. Another question from Leroy Mathias. How best can one make use of CPD training courses, even if one has not yet completed the certification 
or licensing towards APE? Again, the simple answer to that is that it's, you know, it's available, it's available on an electronic format. You don't have to be in a classroom. There's a couple of key modules available right now. Take the time to go and do the course and you're going to benefit from it. And I strongly recommend that people refresh themselves on these things over a period of time as well, because technology is evolving rapidly. So just allocate the time to do it. Time is always precious, but it's available. You know, the, the course data that we've got is available on an electronic format. You can work through it to your own pace and your own time. You don't have to be in one specific location to run the course. Thank you, Charles. I just want to thank all our panellists for an excellent series of presentations, very informative and very interesting. Uh, and thank you for uh, uh, answering the questions. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing more about the, the projects. Thank you.